Uh, well, I'd like you to take a moment and think about the last time that you were thirsty. Uh, and I don't mean that uh, you were thirsty just for like a Dr. Pepper when you were, uh, you know, eating some pizza. What I mean is, when was the last time that you were so dehydrated that your head was beginning to hurt, that your pulse was beginning to maybe rise, and if you asked members of your family, they would tell you maybe you were a bit irritable at that time. Um, I remember uh, the last time was for me just a couple weeks ago. It was a really hot afternoon. I had been uh, putting off planting all these new raspberry bushes that we uh, had bought a number of weeks before, uh, and I needed to get them into the ground. Um, and to do that, I had to cut some sod, but I had to do it carefully with a, with a shovel because I was transplanting that sod to another area of, uh, of the, the yard. Um, and so uh, by the end, I was just, I was sopping wet in, in, in sweat. And when I came into the house, there was only one thing that was on my mind, and that was to, to go and get some uh, go and get some water. Like, I need something to, to drink. And so I grabbed this water bottle that I use, which is rather big. I mean, it's, it's about yay high, and it's, it's, it's pretty big around. And so you can fill that with a lot of water. And, man, I, I slammed that whole thing. I mean, I hardly even, uh, you know, took it away. I just drank the whole thing up. I could have drank more, but at that point, I was, I was already probably so filled with water that if you would have poked me with a needle, I may have leaked. Um, so... I needed to, uh, to um, you know, slow it down a little bit. When we're parched and we're thirsty, we instinctively know what we need. Uh, when you are parched and thirsty, you're not going to go looking for a salt stick. Uh, you're not going to go looking for uh, something that, uh, that will, you know, won't do the trick. Exercise won't help. The one thing that will help is something that will satisfy that longing, that you have. Uh, in his book, The Sahara Unveiled, William Langewicki, uh, he tells the story um, of, uh, of his most uh, desperate thirst strikes through a, a story of an Algerian man named Lag Lag and his companion whose truck broke down in the uh, middle of the Sahara Desert. This is what he writes. He said, they nearly died of thirst during the three weeks they waited before being rescued. As their bodies dehydrated, they became willing to drink anything in hopes of quenching their terrible thirst. The sun forced them into the shade under their truck where they dug a shallow trench. Day after day, they laid there. They had, they had food, but they did not eat because they feared it would magnify their thirst. Dehydration, not starvation, kills wanderers in the desert. And thirst is the most terrible of all human sufferings. And so people with, uh, with such thirst will abandon their sanity and look for relief from anywhere. Uh, in the most desperate cases, there's even documentation of, of people going to urine and even blood. Uh, and it's in these remote areas that people get in the most trouble, especially if they're by a coastal land where uh, in their desperate attempt to get water, they will actually drink uh, seawater, which is the worst thing for them because that will dehydrate them even more having that, uh, that salt water. For Lagleg -Lag and his friend, they ended up resorting to drinking radiator water in order to uh, stay alive. So in order to survive, even the most rational, the most logical person will succumb to drinking even what we would consider poison in order to satisfy that deep need that they, that they have. Now, we might not realize it, but many of us are living uh, dehydrated and desperately thirsty. Uh, we're, we're seeking and searching uh, anywhere and everywhere in all sorts of ways uh, to quench that, that thirst only to find that it doesn't satisfy. And what we actually find is instead of satisfying us, they're slowly killing us. Now, I'm obviously not talking about physical thirst. I'm talking about spiritual thirst. Um, we feel like something is missing. Maybe there's a, a painful longing, 
in our souls, maybe our, uh, in our hearts. Perhaps we're irritable, we're, we're lacking in purpose, and we're lacking in, in meaning. And just like physical thirst, we're going to try to satisfy that desire in any way that we, that we possibly can. So we substitute it for things like money or sex or power or stuff or, or health or even uh, things like family or entertainment, good or bad. We're looking for something to, to quench that spiritual thirst that we have. And we're finding that they're not doing the, the trick. We're drinking spiritual salt water or we're drinking the radiator liquid. Now, the writers of Psalm 42 and 43, I want to invite you to turn to that, by the way. Psalm 42 is someone that we can identify with. Here is a guy that has been through the ringer. We don't know who he is, but the psalm tells us that he is one of the sons of Korah. And that's helpful to know because it it helps us place his location uh, historically and geographically. It's in what's called the Babylonian exile. He's part of a group uh, of, of Judah that was overtaken by the Babylonians in 586 and were brought over to Babylon to essentially adopt the culture and adopt the ways and forget about being uh, Jewish and, their, herita- and, and their, uh, their heritage. Everything that he knew, everything that was precious to him, everything that was, that was dear, everything that gave him fulfillment and satisfaction was left in Judah, and here he is now in this land of Babylon. And the only thing that came with him was a sense of depression, a sense of anxiety, a sense of despair. He was thirsty for normalcy. He was thirsty for purpose thirsty for meaning and thirsty for life. It's in Psalms uh, 42 and 43 that we meet a man who is just like you and me. On the surface, it appears that this man offers us no suggestions of hope. But in examination, he offers us the bottled water of soul satisfaction that we can't find from the world. It's a bottle of water that can quench Uh, the soul, but also leave us spiritually hydrated. It is in Psalms 42 and 43 that we, in our spiritual thirst, find satisfaction in Jesus Christ, our God. Would you read along with me as I, or follow along with me as I read? As the deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come before and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in the procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him. My salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore I remember you from the land of the Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mazar, deep calls to deep. At the roar of your waterfalls, all of your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day the Lord commands a steadfast love. At night his song is within me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go on mourning? Because of the oppression of the enemy. As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me. While they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Psalm 43, 1. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. And from the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Send out your light. Send out your truth and let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God. 
to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre. O oh God, my God, why are you cast down, O oh my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us to find our ultimate satisfaction, our ultimate joy in Christ. Would he satisfy that desire and make us hungry and thirsty for more of him? And it's in Jesus' name that I ask this. Amen. If we want ultimate satisfaction in life, there's three things we need to find in these psalms. The first is we should recognize the, the symptoms of spiritual dehydration. Recognize the symptoms of, of spiritual dehydration. If you were to take a Sunday drive around town or maybe throughout the country, you wouldn't really think it's the end of August, would you? Um, it, maybe by the heat you would, but certainly not uh, uh, by the looks of the yards and the fields. Uh, usually by this time in August, I don't like walking around in my yard and my bare feet because the grass is so dry and it's crunchy and it kind of hurts. But this year we've had such great uh, water, uh, you know, coming from the Lord that uh, I said to Julie the other day, I don't know if our lawn has really ever looked this good in 10 years that we've lived here. It's pretty amazing for the, the end of August. Uh, usually, however, in August, the, the, the lawns are desperate for moisture from the morning dew or, or possibly a, a, a good uh, summer rain. Verse 1 of chapter 42 is, is often uh, viewed much more sentimentally um, than the author, I think, meant it to be. Uh, no doubt that as we were reading that, you were probably uh, singing a familiar song from the 1980s of a worship song, is, as the deer panteth for the water. And we have this, uh, this uh, just this wonderful feeling of a beautiful deer going through a forest with finding streams to, to drink from, when in reality the psalmist is giving the image of a deer who is more like dormant grass. He is far, far away from what he needs, a source of water. He knows what he wants and what he needs, and it's nowhere in sight. How do we know this? Read uh, all of verses 1 through 2. It says, As a deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? In other words, the psalmist is saying, Man, my life is a mess. I can't get anything in order. I'm too depressed to get out of bed. I don't know how any of this is going to work out. I don't know how I'm going to get through the day. Man, I need God, but he's not showing up. Where is he at? I'm dying out here, and he's nowhere to be found. So one of the symptoms of spiritual dehydration then is recognizing that something is off, but not being able to find or grasp relief. It's a constant analysis of the problem without finding help. Another symptom is substitution. If you remember a few minutes ago, I highlighted the, the psychological consequence of uh, severe thirst as a willingness to find relief in, in completely irrational ways. And we see that in verse 3, don't we? What does the psalmist say? It says, my tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? When you, when you were utterly depressed and anxious, and there's really no uh, end in sight, you're going to try to find anything to hold on to, to make you feel alive. For the psalmist, they, they might not feel God's presence, but the, that saltiness of the, the tears reminds them that I mean, they're still alive. There's still something there. They have something. And when you're down in the dumps, what we often do is the worst thing that we can do. 
Instead of looking outside of ourselves and looking up to the heavens from where our help comes from, we rather look introspectively. We uh, look into our thoughts and we give way to our emotions and we justify our thoughts. We justify our, our feelings. And that's a dangerous place because it creates a, a feedback loop. And you all know what a feedback loop is. If I were to take this microphone right now and turn it on, I'm not going to do it because most of you would want to get out of here. And if I were to hold it right down by the speaker here, what would happen is that the microphone would pick up the sound coming out of the speaker and it would start this loop. And within a second, if that even, it would have a really high pitched sound that would be so annoying that you would be covering your ears and wanting me to finish up really quick. So you all know what a, what a feedback loop is. But that's what happens in our souls when our tears become our validation and our relief. And it's not that our emotions aren't valued. It's not that they're not important. God gave us emotions. They're good. We, we ought to think about how we're feeling but not rely on them because they're not reliable. And dangerous things can happen to our souls when we let our emotions be our relief. And another symptom that we find here is dwelling on the past. Look what it says here when it says, uh, well, this is what I would call the, the good old days syndrome. And many of us live in the good old days syndrome. Uh, oftentimes it comes along with, with suffering, but not exclusively. It's, it's when we hyper-focus on, on the good old days and the days that were, uh, that were in the past, uh, and we forget or neglect to see the goodness of, of, of what's in front of us. Look in verse 4. It says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in the procession to the house of God with glad shouts and with songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. In other words, I mean, he's saying, man, as I suffer here, I remember how, how awesome things were once when the kids were still at home when we were part of a thriving community. When we didn't have to worry about the bills. When the marriage was actually working. When life was so much simpler. When I was a leader and people looked up to me. When church was fun. Those are the great things, but they lack hope. When we only look backward, we assume that nothing is redeemable. We assume that nothing new can be good, that nothing can change, and it's all downhill from here. When we are spiritually parched, we will be tempted to dwell on the good old days of the past and only look at the future with pessimism. And so with all these symptoms, the psalmist gives us the central issue or question in these psalms. How do we know it's the central question? Because it is uh, said in, in Psalm 42, verse 5, Psalm 42, verse 11, and Psalm 43, verse 5 as well. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Have you ever felt like that? I mean, depression can be so irrational. And the psalmist cannot understand why he feels the way that he feels. He knows that God is good, but is unwilling to believe that help is in front of him. He's only left with symptoms. And that may be you too. And that's why we need the second, diagnose the problem. Diagnose the problem. The human heart is a very deep well. Remember, the heart is the epicenter of the person. 
It is where all of our thoughts, our desires, who we truly are come from. So if you remember Jesus saying from out of the heart, the mouth speaks, saying that our actions and our words reveal who we truly are inside. And the heart is a very deep well. And so it would be impossible for me to come up here and preach one sermon or even one, have one counseling session with you where we could get down to the very, very root uh, of what is going on in our lives. It'd be very hard to, to take a bucket with one fell swoop and go all the way down to that deep well and scoop up that poisonous thing that is poisoning the water within our hearts. Instead, the, the psalmist here is speaking personally. And we're merely observers. But we can analyze in a general way. The problem, according to verses four, uh, Psalms 42 and 43, is a general problem that if we pay enough attention to and look closely enough, it will save us from a lot of heartache and it will get us on the road to recovery, which we're going to get to in the third point here. So what's the problem that the psalmist is pointing us to? It's a problem of perspective. It's a problem of perspective. It's firstly a problem with the perspective of idealism. What is idealism? I looked in the Oxford Dictionary and it describes idealism as uh, the practice of forming or pursuing ideals, especially unrealistically. Now, I don't mean to uh, offend by what I'm about to say, but some of us have come to the faith with false pretenses. We come to the faith believing that when we come to Christ, everything is going to be wonderful. That we're going to have health. We're going to have wealth. That everything is going to be good. No problems in our lives. That it'll be a life of ease. That somehow life would be better in Christ. And in some ways it is. A lot of ways it is. But not according to the world's ways. The psalmist has fallen into this in verse 6. He says, My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon and Mount Mazar. So remember the psalmist here is, is in exile. He's in Babylon. He is far away from the home that he loves that God had promised to him and his people. And so instead of seeing his current situation, even though it's not what he would want, instead of seeing his situation as the plan of God in his life at this time, he looks to these geographical markers as what it should be. The land of Jordan, the land of Hermon, Mount Mazar, represent how life in his mind is supposed to be. It's beautiful locations. Pastoral, peaceful, providing everything that he needs. In his mind, this is what he deserves. And he is living in an idealistic fantasy world, and it is contributing to his misery. Now, Jesus was very clear that when we become followers of him, life does not get better in a worldly sense. It actually gets more difficult. Because we are his representatives on earth, we should expect to suffer the way that he did. Look in Matthew chapter 5, verse 11, uh, in his, uh, one of his last Beatitudes here. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you. And if we pause there, we'd say, okay, but what does it say? Falsely on my account. It has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with Jesus. John chapter 16, verse 33. In this world you will have tribulation. Acts 14, 22. Paul told them that through many trials and tribulations we must enter the kingdom of heaven. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 14. Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. What should be strange is when nothing is happening to us. But rejoice 
insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. And to the psalmist, I mean, he looks at those kind of things and he says, that, no, 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 that should not be. That's not what life is supposed to be like. And he illustrates it like being on the shore of Lake Superior in November. If you've ever been there in November or December and the winds are high and they're crashing against the rocks and it's dangerous for you to be uh, near the exact shore there. Verse 7, deep calls out to deep. At the roar of your waterfalls, all the breakers and the waves have gone over me. And so in the psalmist's view, man, it's just one thing after another. I can't get any relief. And it's a problem of perspective. But notice the other problem of perspective here. And that is that he's suffering from caring too much what other people think. Verses 9 and 10. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go on mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me, while they say to me all day long, where is your God? And granted, some of us have thicker skin than others. Some of us are wired just differently. But when we have an unhealthy obsession with the opinion of others, it makes sense when you would say, why are you cast down, O my soul? Now, there are some opinions that you need to care about. I care about my wife's opinion of me. I care about my kids' opinion of me, my my close friends that love me enough to tell me, you're a little off here. I care about those opinions. But the ones that are evil and just saying things that aren't even true, no, 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 no. I can't listen to that. And when we uh, obsess over the applause of people, uh, inevitably you will lose yourself. You will compromise your beliefs and do things you never would have done. You will live in hopelessness and despair. When you have an unhealthy obsession with what other people think or say, we need to ask ourselves a couple of questions. First, is this a voice that I should listen to? Second, if not, why do I care? And finally, we should ask, is living for the smile of others my true God? Is being a people pleaser a way that you are worshiping the God of other people's nice thoughts about you? When we take these two things into perspective, we can diagnose the problem. It is idolatry. It would make sense that we would feel disjointed from God when we have substituted him for an ideal or the praise of people. We should feel that something is wrong in our hearts when people are big and God is small. That's the diagnosis. But finally, we should seek treatment. We should seek treatment. It's not just enough to go to the doctor and he tells you of a terminal disease and you say, thanks doc, we'll see you later. It would be helpful if you gave him some treatment, right? And we've recognized the symptoms. We've got the diagnosis. Now, uh, Psalm 42 is all indicative. It's only explaining the problem. Uh, It isn't until we get to Psalm 33 that we find relief that we desperately need. We stop fiddling with lesser things, and we go to God. Psalm 43, verse 1, is the first time that the psalmist engages God in prayer. Vindicate me, O God. 
Defend my cause against an ungodly people, and from the deceit and unjust man, deliver me. This is no longer rambling about his problems. He's no longer just throwing a pity party. He is taking that and going directly to God and saying, God, I need you to do something here because if it were up to me, I'm going to keep losing every single time. Vindicate me. Prove me to be right. I can't get anywhere with these people. I can't get anywhere with my own mind. Help me. I need you to come and take over. And not only does he ask for vindication, notice that he asks for a defense. Come and defend me, God. Get, don't just give me a shield, but fight back. If you step into the ring with one of these fools, you can be victorious. I can't. From the defense, he asks for deliverance. And if uh, we're successfully defended and uh, left to pick up the pieces, we would be a mess. But God is the one who comes and picks up those pieces. It's interesting, an interesting thing about this psalm and this request is it, there's something that we don't often take into consideration. Remember that uh, the, the psalmist is going to God with bold requests in the context of feeling abandoned or feeling apart from God, a feeling an alienation from the Lord. And in that alienation, he just doesn't sit around. He presses into God further. And he asks God, why? Look at verse 2. You are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? So he has stopped the inner conversation, which often gets us into a lot of trouble, doesn't it? When we are our own counselors, that is when trouble most happens. And so he gets out of this, this inner mind and he verbalizes it. God, I take refuge in you. In verse 42, he calls, uh, sorry, Psalm 42, he calls God the li his living God. He calls him his salvation. In verse 6, he calls him my God. In verse 8, he says, you're the God of my life. In verse 9, he says, you are my rock. He is daring to confront his own thoughts with the truth of who God is and, acting God, and asking God to act in accordance with those things. And in doing so, he presses into God further. He says, send out your light and your truth. Now, there should be an italics in here, but there's not. Let them lead me. Let them lead me. Bring me to your holy hill and your dwelling. We have a culture right now that is absolutely obsessed with living your personal truth. Oh, that's just my truth. You need to live your truth. You need to live your best truth. And the psalmist is looking at that and looking at that part of our culture and says, yeah, good luck with that. Only God's light only God's truth will do what we truly need. The only thing that will quench our spiritual thirst, which is found in verse 4, is Jesus. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre. O oh God, my God. The cure for spiritual dehydration is the joy of the Lord found in worshiping Jesus. Worship that isn't just singing for a few minutes here on Sunday morning, but worship that is living every second of every single day for the glory and honor of Jesus. And the joy that comes from living a life of faith can only become, can only come because Jesus lived these psalms before us and on behalf of us. In Christ's suffering, he was more spiritually dehydrated and thirsty than we could ever be. He who made the world but was not recognized or received by the world. He who Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 55 was 
uh, rejected and despised by man, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. I mean, this is, the, uh, this is Jesus who enjoyed perfect fellowship uh, within the Trinity, within God the Father and God uh, the Holy Spirit together from eternity, uh, was the one who cried from the cross, my God, my God, why have you uh, forsaken me? It was Christ who most fully cried out, as a deer pants for the water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? In bearing the fulfillment of these psalms, in complete and obedient faith, he was vindicated. He was defended and delivered when he walked out of the tomb unscathed. And because he did, the tone of this repeated theme is now different in Psalm 43. In Psalm 42, verse 5 and 11, it was all introspective and it was all, it was all found in grief. But now it's in triumph in verse uh, 5 of chapter 43 when he says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? You see the difference there? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And now it's, why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Christ has lived. Christ has died. Christ has risen and will come again. Therefore, I'm going to hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. See, the cure for our spiritual dehydration, the cure for our spiritual drought, our depression, is and always will be Jesus. So rather than panting endlessly for uh, streams that will never satisfy, we flock to Jesus who is the, the spiritual water that we need, who is also the shepherd that leads us beside still waters, who restores our souls and leads us in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Friends, go to Jesus and be satisfied. Let's pray.